Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, News Podcast and Opportunities for Publishers. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dialing information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce your first speaker, Emily Quinn. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Emily Quinn. I work here at Reuters, and I'm responsible for leading the product development of Reuters Audio. So I, like many of you, am particularly interested in the subject of today's webinar, and I'm very excited to hear all the report's findings in more detail. I'm also delighted to be joined today by our esteemed guest and author of the report, Nick Newman. Nick is a senior research fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, a research institute based at Oxford University, which, while fully independent of Reuters and its research, is part funded by the Thomson Reuters Foundation. For any of you that don't know Nick, he is a journalist and digital strategist, and he's someone who's been at the forefront of change in the news industry for many years. He's played a key role in shaping the BBC's internet services for over a decade and was a founding member of the BBC News' website, leading its international coverage as well as editor. Prior to this, Nick has forged a career in radio news at the BBC World Service and, very relevant to today's report, went on to become head of product development for BBC News, helping to introduce innovations such as blogs, on-demand video and podcasting, launching one of BBC News' first podcasts. I'm now going to hand you over to Nick, who will be taking us through the latest report on news podcasts and the opportunities for publishers. And then in about 25 minutes, we'll come back to our audience for questions, which I'm sure there'll be plenty of. Nick, over to you. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for joining. Uh, I would also just at the beginning like to thank my co-author on this uh, project, Nathan Gallo, who did a lot of the data work and also to the uh, many publishing executives uh, and other experts who gave up their time to talk to us about the subject. And I guess you're here because podcasting is one of the hottest topics in media right now. And part of the reason is uh, audience growth. And this is some data from our digital news report, which really just shows what a worldwide phenomenon this is. So across all of our countries, 36% um, say they listen to a podcast monthly. Quite a few of those are news. And a lot of this is really being driven by younger audiences, so the, those elusive younger audiences. Uh, it's not just us at the Reuters Institute. Uh, Edison Research, which probably does the, the sort of the, the, the most um, uh, detailed research on podcasting, has, double, has documented a doubling in consumption in the US over the last four years. So something like 90 million people listening to a podcast monthly. Uh, here in the UK, we have Rajar doing regular surveys. Uh, they showed an increase in listening of podcasts of something like 40% in the last year alone. So we know quite a bit about the audience side. Um, but what we don't know so much about is, is the content side of the, what publishers are doing, what their motivations are. And, uh, and also the extent to which podcasting is really extending outside of the US uh, and to some extent other English speaking countries. And that's really what this report was about. Uh, so we really set out to answer four key questions. So on the supply side, what types of news, news podcasts are being produced and who's producing them? Secondly, we wanted to really sort of understand and dig down more into this category of daily news podcasts. And that's partly because of the enormous success of The Daily from The New York Times and other similar shows. So we really wanted to know what's working there. Uh, then thirdly, we wanted to understand some of the wider publisher motivations. Uh, so you know, beyond news podcasts, what are they interested in? Why? How does the monetization work? And then finally, uh, we've seen uh, Spotify investing in, in podcasts. We've seen Google including podcasts in search. We really wanted to understand 
the implications of that and also their plans for the future. So those, it's quite a quite a wide ranging set of questions that, that, that we had. Um, and I'm going to run through some of the sort of findings. Just briefly in terms of methodology, uh, we basically looked at, analyzed, and coded the top 200 podcasts in the Apple podcast charts uh, for news and politics category in, in five countries. So we looked at the UK, uh, the US, obviously, because that's where all of the action is. Australia, another English-speaking country where they've really embraced podcasts. France, a large non-English-speaking country, um, which is starting to embrace podcasts. And then Sweden, which has had a long tradition of uh, heavy audio use. So we looked at these to identify categorizations of, of news podcasts. Secondly, in terms of the daily news podcasts, uh, we, we uh, combined some of that data, we, we looked in more detail at it. We also use proprietary data from publishers and interview data as well. And then uh, finally, we did interviews with around 30 different publishers and broadcasters, as well as platforms and, ex and experts to understand more about their plans and their future directions. So just firstly, definitions. Uh, this is quite tricky. Um, so in one sense, it's anything that publishers submitted into the Apple podcast directory. Uh, in practical terms, you know, podcast is, uh, you can define it as a digital audio file that uh, you can subscribe to or you can download, or increasingly you can just stream now from uh, either from specialist apps or increasingly just from websites. So, um, you know, the way people are accessing podcasts has changed quite a lot. And we're also defining within that um, high level definition, we're defining native podcasts, so essentially shows that are specifically created for the medium. And then we're distinguishing that from catch up radio shows, which obviously started life on the radio, but have a second life as a podcast. And, and these differences obviously are not always clear cut and they're not particularly important to audiences. It's just content, but it's worth definitely bearing in mind when we're thinking about the production dynamics. Okay, so first let's look at podcasts overall and how news fits in with podcasts overall. So this is data that was provided to us uh, by Chartable, which is a company that does podcast analytics. And this chart really just shows the, the growth in the number of new podcasts being produced every year. So, you know, you can see exponential growth um, in terms of the supply. Uh, this year alone, 200,000 new podcasts uh, have been created. Uh, in total, 771,000 in the Apple Podcast Directory, so some are falling off as well. Uh, you can also see how uh, the, the serial, that true crime podcast in 2014, many people talk about that as a trigger. Uh, it was a huge global hit with hundreds of millions of listeners, and it really sort of sparked a lot of interest. It gave people confidence to get stuck into podcasting. And then, uh, again, a big change in 2017. Uh, it's almost doubling between 2017 and 18 in terms of new podcast production. And that was also the time when you started to see publishers like the New York Times getting involved with the daily. So that's podcasts in general. But what proportion of all of these are news? Well, uh, again, according to Chartable, we find just 6% of all of the podcasts are news podcasts. So uh, that's about 50,000 in the directory. So it's still a lot. But if we look at the Apple podcast episode charts, so that's the, the sort of the, the weekly charts for uh, the most popular uh, individual programs, uh, and it's broadly based on consumption, we can see that news makes up 21% of the top shows. So news is really punching above its weight. So a relatively small number of shows being listened to proportionately much more than some other genres. And just another sort of data point to back that up. In the US, there's a, a chart organized by um, PodTrack. They've aggregated with publisher permissions, a whole load of data about sort of popular publisher um, podcasts. And there you see the daily is the number one and up first from NPR is number two. So you, of all podcasts, so you can see that news is really uh, a very strong category. Now let's look in a bit more detail at the different types of news podcasts. So splitting those news podcasts down into further categorization. And a reminder, this is based on us analyzing and categorizing the top 200 shows in five countries. And at a high level, we sort of identify five different types. So you've got uh, daily news, and that includes some of those native shows like the daily, but also catch up radio programs from broadcast. 
Secondly, you've got talk and interview shows. Uh, so as, as an example there, I've got um, political gab fest from Slate, which is obviously uh, made for the medium, one of the first. You've also got catch up radio programs like in the UK, Nigel Farage show, which he does on the radio and then goes out as a podcast. Thirdly, you have episodic series. Uh, so single topic. Uh, so this is a bit like a Netflix series. You may have a, a, a season one, season two, uh, such as Serial. Um, another good example is The Teacher's Pet, uh, which was produced by The Australian, a newspaper, another breakout hit. Um, and then you have documentary strands or series. So these continue over time with a range of different programs coming through, such as P3 from Sweden. Very, very successful there. And then finally, uh, long read. So these may be print articles which become podcasts which are kind of read out. And if we uh, if we look at the numbers on that split out by countries, you can see that the biggest category uh, actually is these uh, unscripted interview talk shows. Uh, these are pretty cheap to produce. There's a huge number of them. And then the second biggest block is the episodic series, uh, especially in the US. You can see 42% of all of the uh, Top podcasts are episodic series. Australia, half, 51%. True crime is a really big thing in Australia. And then uh, documentaries and then daily news shows. Uh, so relatively small in terms of numbers, but as we've already mentioned, they punch above their weight at the top end of the charts. So if we look at then at the producers of news podcasts, again, we've kind of identified five high-level categories. Uh, so you've got broadcasters at the top there. Uh, like BBC, NPR, ABC in Australia, Radio France, uh, Swedish Radio. You also then have uh, print publishers and digital media, so Washington Post uh, as a print publisher or digital born outlets like Slate and Vox, which have invested very heavily. Uh, thirdly, you have these podcasting companies or podcasting studios, they're often called. Uh, Gimlet Media, for example, uh, was bought by Spotify, uh, Wondery, Louis Media in France, uh, and then you have independent producers and uh, a range of others, including academic institutions. So the Reuters Institute, for example, runs a series of, of podcasts uh, as an example. And then if we look at the numbers on that, uh, again, split by country, you can see that the bulk of top podcasts are produced by broadcasters. And, and in a way, that's not surprising because uh, they have a huge amount of radio output, which they reversion for podcasts. So this sort of catch up radio uh, makes it easier for them to get a lot of content out there. And then secondly, you have print or digital born publishers and then podcast producers and individuals. It's just worth pointing out some of the country differences. So uh, in the pink there, you can see France. 80% of the top news podcasts in France come from broadcasters. That's primarily Radio France uh, and the various brands underneath it. Um, and that's partly because there's really not a lot of competition in France from print publishers or digital-born publishers or um, uh, th there's been slow investment in independent um, production as well. Whereas if you look at the United States, for example, you see a very different picture. Uh, so um, you see broadcasters not quite as strong, only 35%. Um, that's partly, of course, because the print and digital media have created and invested very hard in some fantastic native shows to compete with broadcasters. You also have that incredibly strong independent sector. So Gimlet and Wondery in the States, in total, 19% of the top shows are produced um, by, by those kind of companies. And then individuals and independents too. So a much more sort of balanced picture, much more competitive picture in the US compared with the other countries that we studied. And if we look at the types of shows that are produced, this is a bit of a generalization, but you have um, print and digital born brands tending to do more unscripted talk and interview shows. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples there. And, and this is partly because it's just a really easy way to reuse the talents in the newsroom. This is something that can be done alongside other work. Um, so, I mean, Giles Corrin is a very good example. He works for The Times here in London. And he has a podcast, which is about what's going to be in his column uh, this week. And he talks about it to, to his wife. And that's the basis of the podcast. Very successful. Ezra Klein in the US for Vox, uh, one of 200 podcasts now produced by Vox. That number has doubled in the last year or so. Um, and then broadcasters, again, uh, you know, broadcasters are doing a lot of unscripted as well. But proportionally, a lot of their top shows are 
our scripted documentary series. So again, they're kind of reusing a lot of those audio documentary making skills they already have in house. So an example would be uh, the current BBC hit is called Tunnel 29. It's a fantastic series um, going back to when the, the Berlin Wall fell, sort of historical. Uh, it's part of a wider documentary series called Intrigue. Uh, and then you've also got their ABC in Australia with a program about uh, Russia, if you're listening, um, which sort of started off looking at Russian influence in the US elections and has gone on to, I think, the third series of that now. So these are just kind of examples. In general, we find that there's quite a bit of listening to non-domestic podcasts. That's essentially what this chart shows. So if you look at the UK, Australia, and Sweden, the pink wedges essentially show uh, people are listening to programs that don't come from those countries. So a lot of that is US uh, shows. Um, so language is not a barrier here. Whereas if you compare that with France, you can see it's almost exclusively French domestically produced uh, content that is being listened to. So there's very little cut through for those US shows in France. And then the US, a different story again, a lot of high quality domestic content to so 93% of the listening is to shows that were produced in the US, uh, only 7% from outside. And it's really hard for those shows to get cut through. Uh, most of the ones we found were from the BBC, the FT, The Economist, these kind of very big uh, British brands. Uh, by the way, the Daily uh, from New York Times is in the top 200 in all five countries that we look at. And then this chart looks at uh, the percentage of native catch up, sorry, native podcasts versus catch up podcasts in the top 200 in each country. Again, uh, you see how France is such an outlier. So there's, there's much less native content being produced, much more catch up radio, uh, dominating 68% of the top podcasts are catch up radio. Uh, and I think we can expect that to change in France. Um, you know, where there is high quality content that is being made specifically for podcasts, it tends to do better. So as we see more independent production and print organizations getting involved in France, I would expect that percentage to change. So that's a kind of overview of the categorization. Now I'm gonna basically drill down into this uh, sector uh, around daily news podcasts. And in this part, I'm gonna exclude all of the catch up radio stuff. So we're really looking just at those shows that are created uh, for podcasting specifically and go out every day. And uh, we've identified across the five countries about 60 of these. And this chart really just shows how fast these have grown. Uh, the majority of them have launched in the last 18 months or certainly since the beginning of 2018. You can really see that, that line sort of steepening there. And you can see where the daily uh, started in the beginning of 2017. And many of the sort of recent editions, uh, you can see there the journal, uh, the leader from the Evening Standard couple of, uh, in the UK started a couple of months ago. Uh, we've had in, just literally in the last month or so a whole load of daily impeachment podcasts starting in the US and also US election podcasts uh, going daily. Um, in the UK, the Times announced yesterday that they were going to start next year a, a daily news podcast. We had the Daily Mail, I think, uh, last week starting their daily news podcast. So this is, um, this is becoming a flood. Uh, if we divide the category Further, we can see um, some different kinds of daily news podcasts. So we've kind of divided it really into three types. So at the bottom there in the pink, uh, you can see a sort of cluster of podcasts that are between um, zero and or between one minute and, and six minutes. We're calling these sort of micro bulletins. So it's kind of news on demand. Many of them are aimed at sort of voice devices, uh, BBC Minute, for example, NPR News Now. Um, and uh, they're also available as podcasts, but they're sort of maybe slightly different. Then you've got in the blue, you've got um, what we're calling news roundups, and uh, they often have three or four items in it. They're looking to very quickly update people on the news of the day, either in general, like at first, or FT business briefing, for example, within a specific genre. And then at the top, you've got in orange, the deep dives. So essentially one program, one subject at length, and this is where you've got, uh, from France, you've got Code Source and La Story from uh, Le Parisien and Les Echo. You have Beyond Today from the BBC. You've got uh, The Signal from ABC. You've got The Daily, Today and Focus, et cetera. And then when we look at uh, which of these are sort of popular in terms of the episodes, 
um, it's quite interesting. There are a few sort of interesting differences. So in, in the UK and the US, it tends to be the deep dives that are doing best. So New York Times say that I think 2 million people a day now listen to the daily. Uh, that's doubled from a year ago. Today in Focus from The Guardian has an audience, uh, they say, that is bigger than by the print newspaper. So that's hundreds of thousands every day. And they've achieved that in less than a year. Uh, in Australia, you've got ABC's The Signal aimed at younger audiences, but also a whole load of uh, smaller independent media, actually, who, who are really dominating the space. So Schwartz Media uh, with 7am, which is a, um, a deep dive program, The Quickie, Squiz Today. These are digital born outlets. And then uh, a different story again in Sweden, where actually it's micro bulletins and news roundups that are proving the most popular with Swedish radio's Ekop news brand. And then the Omnipod, which is more of a news roundup um, uh, at the top. And uh, you've got uh, Aston Blatt's Daily, which is a sort of deep dive actually running behind. So, uh, you know, it's a slightly different picture in, in different countries. In terms of practicalities, so how do you do one of these things? Um, the New York Times says the Daily uh, now has around 15 dedicated staff working on it. So it's a big production effort. It's part, obviously, of a wider audio team of 30. Uh, the Economist and The Guardian, about eight each. But some of the smaller uh, shows that have more recently started, uh, typically you have about four or five uh, people. Um, uh, but the whole point, of course, is that they are accessing the whole talent of the newsroom and bringing that to life. So these are the numbers I'm giving you, are dedicated people working on the program. And the typical makeup would be um, a host, a producer, executive producer, and a sound engineer. Uh, in some cases, People were bringing in um, uh, expertise in audio from elsewhere, either from radio or from podcasts. In other cases, uh, they, they're bringing somebody from staff, and uh, that's obviously famously in the case of Michael Barbaro. The Daily was already on New York Times staff um, and, and without very much radio experience and, and brought him uh, into a podcast environment. Uh, so uh, relatively substantial investments, but is it paying off? Can you make money? from daily news podcasts. Um, so some people are making money. Uh, the Intelligence, which has a weekly audience of about half a million, uh, say they're listening to two or three episodes each week, and it says it's already making money, um, and that they've had huge demand for sponsorship, so it's more than paying for itself, uh, well ahead of the business plan. Uh, in the UK uh, and US, people told us that blue chip advertisers are really piling in, so if they're not if they're not profitable yet, they're on 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 sort of uh, track to be published profitable. And the New York Times uh, doesn't give exact figures, but it says sponsorship that revenue for the daily uh, is running into eight figures. So it's, it's really substantial. But uh, we also found that that's not the case everywhere. So obviously, much less uh, the advertising is much less developed in smaller countries. So in Denmark, Politiken is finding it much harder to get the advertisers interested. Uh, despite having a very high quality podcast. And it's a similar story in some other countries. So there may, this may just be a lag, or it may be that um, smaller countries just simply don't have the scale to make this work. And I think that's something we're going to find out over the next few years. What's interesting is that um, we're seeing some different models. It may not all be about advertising. Politican, for example, has a few days free, and then three days are sort of bundled in with its subscription. So they're trying to essentially use podcasts as a way of driving loyalty with existing users as well. And I think that's going to be an increasing um, focus. So it's interesting that for many of those we talked to, the main aim wasn't necessarily to make short-term money. They were also focused on increasing loyalty and building habit, which is something everyone's talking about in the industry. Uh, so the majority of people, as I've mentioned, are listening to two or three editions a week, um, completion rates of about 70 to 80 percent. And um, you know, for the daily, uh, this is really showcasing the value of New York Times journalism for existing subscribers. As you can see there, 25 minutes a day is, is a really significant amount of time. Um, but the second motivation is also to use podcasts, which are freely available, to attract the next generation of subscribers or, or in the case of broadcasters, next generation of listeners. So radio listeners are getting older. And podcasts really do attract audiences that are much younger. Uh, as you can see, NPR talks about their podcast audiences being 20 years younger than the radio audience. So this is kind of future-proofing uh, organizations, uh, radio radio companies in, in particular. Um, and then um, 
Finally, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of changing nature of um, platforms and the growth of a whole host of uh, podcast intermediaries. So uh, for almost 20 years, actually, podcasts, or 15 years, podcasts have been associated with, with Apple and iPods and iPhones. And we now really see that starting to change. Uh, so this is, um, this is US-focused data from Libsyn, which is a major hosting platform. And it shows that Apple Podcasts is still, you know, the giant, the elephant in the room, 58% uh, accessing about Apple Podcasts. But, but watch Spotify. Spotify a year ago were about 7%. It's now 13%. So they've kind of doubled their market share. And in some parts of Europe, we think this is even higher. And this is kind of important because, um, you know, you have Google now putting uh, podcasts in search results um, and Spotify really taking podcasts to people who, you know, not of that higher demographic, not using Apple devices. This is kind of moving it beyond the elite latte drinking demographics. And, you know, one of Spotify's stated aims actually is to bring podcasts to a wider audience and to, you know, take it, take it out to, to different groups of people. And, uh, you know, as part of that, they are investing uh, something like $500 million in podcasting. That's in original content, but it's also in distribution and better discovery. Uh, so uh, just as some examples, they've signed up these German comedians for exclusive content. They're some of the most popular uh, podcasts on, on, the, on the platform. Uh, so this is exclusive uh, or at least first, first use. Um, the one in the middle I can recommend, I've listened to myself, The Story of the Clash, uh, you know, fantastic music documentary which was a co-production with BBC Studios. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of these kind of originals, uh, music documentaries, sport, this is really going to help take it to different demographics. And then on the right, um, you've got some of the work they're doing into discovery. So they've just launched in most countries or many countries automated podcast playlists. So it looks at what you're listening to and then gives you more of that. Uh, and then the one on the right is only in the U.S. so far. It's called the, uh, Your Daily Drive, and it basically takes your favorite music and mixes it with short uh, speech, spoken word podcasts. Uh, I think this is really interesting and potentially very disruptive. And then if that wasn't enough, you see a whole load of other um, new platforms launching in the last year or so, um, many of them looking to become the Netflix of podcasting, uh, also trying to sign up in particular countries, exclusive content or first use content at the very least. So in the US, you've got Luminary um, and also Himalaya. Uh, in France, you've got uh, Magellan and Sybil, uh, recently launched um, with a uh, focus on French speaking native storytelling. Uh, and in Denmark, Podimo, which has recently launched as a paid service uh, with exclusive content and they're planning to launch in Germany. They have ambitions way beyond that. So, um, you know, all of these, uh, Stitcher Premium, a whole load of others as well, um, means that we're going to have free podcasts, but we're also going to have this premium layer. We're going to have paid podcasts as well, uh, for which people will pay uh, a subscription of some kind. And then if that wasn't enough, finally, on the platform side, we've got the broadcasters. So, um, you know, BBC Sounds, uh, so the BBC has revamped its audio offer. Uh, so it's no longer called radio, it's called Sounds and that incorporates podcasts. You've got ABC Listen, SR Play, NPR One, Radio France. So these are all apps. They want to have that direct connection with audiences. They want people to come to them first. And they're often putting content first in their own apps and then later releasing that content elsewhere to try and keep that direct connection. Uh, so this sort of windowing strategy that we see in television is really coming to audio as well. Um, in other cases, the BBC uh, uh, and, and others are withholding content from certain platforms. The BBC has pulled its podcast from Google because, as you can see in this quote, it thinks that Google is preferencing its own podcast service through search. And although Google is addressing that issue and is going to allow um, publishers to uh, choose how to set that up so that you can actually have that direct relationship, um, I think publishers generally are extremely concerned that their content is going to be used to drive um, other people's businesses, the businesses of platforms, and, um, and that they will uh, lose a lot of the value, uh, which is obviously what we've seen in, in some of the previous sort of platform wars. So um, I think this is a, a space to watch. So just before we go into questions, just to sort of recap some of the main uh, points of this report. So firstly, you know, podcasting 
I, I think is really moving into a new phase now. There is more money coming in that is feeding better content. And in turn, that is increasing demand from audiences. So we're in this sort of virtuous cycle of growth, uh, which I think will go on for some time. Obviously, there are lots and lots of different kinds of podcasts. News and politics really just just one of them. But but news really punches above its weight. You know, there's something about the stickiness of it, uh, the, the sort of uh, the, the relevance of it. Uh, daily news podcasts in particular are striking a chord with people. Lots of people like these formats, and many have built them into their daily habits. Thirdly, podcasts are increasingly a good source of revenue. So for some, they are covering costs in their own right, but they have these added benefits of generating loyalty, uh, habit, and attracting a much younger audience. Uh, important caveat, though, outside the US, those audiences are smaller and there's much less revenue. So the, um, the, the business case is absolutely not proven uh, outside the US in many cases. And then finally, um, platforms are moving in. This will really grow the audience uh, to different demographics, um, but that's a sort of positive in terms of the potential for all of this, but it also risks a lot of those sort of dangers for publishers in terms of, you know, how do you get your content discovered if you have to go through somebody else, uh, you're dependent on somebody else for that, but also your ability to really build and sustain direct uses over time with audiences. So those are just some of the sort of core uh, findings of the report and uh, really, really keen to hear uh, your questions. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, some really interesting insights and uh, good news in terms of consumption and growth in the news category. Um, but still, in terms of the scale of opportunity, I think there are going to be lots of questions and lots to discuss further. Um, so given this, um, we're going to go straight into some questions that were submitted by the audience um, during the presentation. And just to remind um, all of you that you can still submit questions um, through the questions section in your attendee control panel. Um, so Nick, just to get us started, um, given we were just talking um, about markets outside of the US, we have um, a question, question from Pavan in India, who's a podcaster, and wants to know how we should approach news and current affairs podcasts outside of the US, and how do you convince media houses and other funders um, in what is a nascent but growing market? Yeah, it's a fantastic question, and the, tr the truthful answer is we don't know an enough about these different markets and how it's going to work. I think we won't have, you know, the U.S. model won't be the same everywhere. Uh, as we've seen with digital uh, and everything else, the, the, the U.S. is a very particular market. What happens in the U.S. doesn't work everywhere. On the other hand, uh, some of these ge general trends, I think, are here to stay. So audio is going to become more important everywhere because, um, because of better headphones, because of voice, because of... Um, uh, you know, in-car, uh, on-demand audio, in-car, all of these things, I think, are going to drive on-demand audio. Uh, the different types of on-demand audio will partly be driven by what publishers do. It will partly be driven by what consumers want. Uh, but I think there's definitely some opportunities, you know, just look at the things that are working. So things like a daily news podcast that, that hits a morning commute for people is probably going to work in most countries if you're in there in early, early mover advantage. Great. And um, in terms of that, in, in looking at um, measurement and, and yeah. success, um, I've got a question from Peter who says, what stats were you able to find that highlighted the difference between downloads and actual listens? Right. So it, uh, it's a great question. So um, podcasting is really hard to measure um, accurately because uh, although there is an increasing amount of streaming, uh, you know, Spotify, of course, is most of that is, is, is stream, not download. Um, when you the, the the current standards, the new standards, which are the IAB two standards, count basically the stream and they count the download, mm -hmm. and we don't know whether people listen to the download or not. So in some sense, this is a proxy for for true usage, but we don't really know how many people are listening. Now there is a lot of work being done. So organisations like NPR put little trackers in to try and get a sense of how many uh, of these downloads are listened to and for how long. Um, but uh, I think, you know, one of the things that surprised me is that most of the advertisers weren't particularly bothered about that. They yeah. think the measurement is currently good enough. They recognize there are problems. There have been a few cases of, of fraud and people trying to sort of increase the numbers, um, as in other areas of digital. But in general, there seems to be a, a, an exception. And I think the IAB2 standard really also helps because it's sort of giving people a, a benchmark rather than everyone reporting different numbers. Great. 
And um, and then in terms of topics and, and various categories that do well, um, Nigel asked, did your research suggest of business news and current affairs has any appeal to audiences or sponsors? Um, it hasn't exploded as much so far. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just a huge subject, isn't it? Because it, it covers everything. and It's really hard to categorize a lot of things. Um, but I think, I mean, a lot of the things that, that I'm talking about when I talk about daily news podcasts is really current affairs. Um, it, you know, what the daily going into a topic in, in enormous depth, you know, it's much of it will still be relevant in two or three days time. You know, this is, um, uh, and then there's a lot of sort of documentary stuff as well. Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, the BBC, uh, with its Beyond Today slot, for example, which is aimed at younger audiences, one of the things it's doing, rather than starting current affairs podcasts, is actually using Beyond Today as a showcase for current affairs material. So, for example, when there's a big television documentary, Panorama, they will get the reporter from Panorama on, onto Beyond Today, and they'll do an interview with some sound, and they'll sort of bring it to life and bring the characters to life. So they did an amazing one about uh, the Hong Kong protests. Um, with a Newsnight um, reporter, they did uh, Jane Corbyn, Panorama on Shoggy, which is one of their best best um, used uh, podcasts. And that's essentially, rather than creating another podcast, you're essentially using these vehicles as a way of driving stories to a different audience in that particular case. Great. And on that, we've had a couple of questions around what's going on in B2B and um, how do we create podcasts for that market? Uh, I know very little about B2B. That's a really good question. I'm sure the questioner knows more than I do. Um, I mean, I, th I think the, the, the sort of headline is that audio is relevant um, for all the other reasons that I said. Um, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's a great way of, uh, of, of learning and progressing. So when we asked consumers why they listen to news podcasts, one of them was to keep up to date. But... Um, this idea of learning and progress, particularly within your job, I think is going to be incredibly important. And, and talking to the FT about their strategy, they're looking at things like, and obviously they have a big B2B element as well, but they were looking at um, sort of workplace. A lot of the, 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 um, the consumer facing brands I was talking to were interested in um, some of these uh, workplace issues or how do you provide content around learning and progress. So I think that's one way of thinking about it. You know, how can you use your existing audience? How can you create content for them that's relevant for them um, that really sort of works in audio and is going to fit into their lives that they can access when they're in the gym or on their commute? You know, it's, it's the same principle as for, as for consumers, I think. Great. And how are you finding that news organizations um, are using non-audio content like websites and newsletters, et cetera, to convert their existing audiences to listeners of their podcast. Yeah, it's a bit of a trade-off, isn't it? Because you've got limited real estate in your in your email. Um, but absolutely, that's I mean, for for people who are launching new podcasts, they're essentially using their new 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 their existing channels. So I think the Guardian basically for sort of the first six months on their app, they had the ad for the podcast, and they may still have it there. I can't remember. Uh, and absolutely in the newsletters as well. They're driving, uh, you know, uh, I was talking to a number of publishers who have this sort of matrix and they say, okay, well, we've got people who are existing users who we think we can progress to podcasts. That's kind of low hanging fruit. Yeah. And then you've got people who are never going to be interested in podcasts who are existing, um, who, who are not listeners. We're probably not going to focus on those. So, you know, they, they're kind of thinking about different audiences. And I suppose the real question is, is it going to cannibalize uh, existing usage and and you know I put that to a lot of the publishers so for example you know I'm finding I'm reading less newsprint as a result yeah. of listening to more audio um, obviously the publishers say that's not the case and that's not coming out of their data but I'm not sure I, I believe it. it's a trade-off absolutely and one another question obviously that everyone wants to know um, is how we make podcasting profitable and um, apart from sponsorship, um, have you seen any other revenue generating models um, being tried out by publishers? Yeah, um, so I, th I think I think this is really really interesting. So so sponsorship and advertising, and it's just worth saying actually that uh, daily news podcast is um, is uh, quite difficult because the sort of the, the highest value ad slot is a, is called a host read. So that's essentially where the host you know, the content is integrated with the content. It's a bit like native advertising. And that obviously is a real problem within news broadcasts. So 
Uh, they're having to get around that by this sort of quite quasi sponsorship where somebody has say 50% of share of voice. So that's typically how, how it would be done. Uh, beyond that, um, you've got um, you've got some paid models emerging. So I, I mentioned Politicon. So there are people who essentially have it as part of the subscription package. Um, Zetland in Denmark is another that essentially is a paid provider and the podcast is part of a, of a loyalty play. Uh, you have um, selling tickets for events. So again, you know, I think the, the Guardian sold out the Palladium for its, uh, uh, which is a big uh, London yeah. theatre with literally thousands of people for football podcasts. And there are loads of um, uh, of these going on. I was in Kenya recently, and and uh, they were actually making no money from the podcast from advertising. All the money was coming from uh, shows they did once a month for um, for for the, for the um, recording of the podcast. Nice. Uh, merchandise, uh, you know. So, so I think there are um, there are a range of different. Uh, but the key one is 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 loyalty. Actually, that you're using podcasts for marketing vehicles to get people to for your subscription. So, the Economist, for example, does uh, links with special voucher codes, and then uh, you know they do a special offer for podcast listeners, New York Times, etc. Uh, it's how do you drive people from uh, these open platforms into uh, a relationship of paying. Absolutely. And then in terms of um, smaller audiences, we've had quite a few questions on what your thoughts are on the opportunities within local news. Mm. That's, uh, you know, we, we didn't do much on local news um, and it's partly, uh, there is a lot of local uh, stuff going on. I did talk to Trinity Mirror here in the UK who had quite a lot of success with um, with football podcasts and particularly, you know, that's an area that they can really own because they already have that sort of relationship with the local football club, for example. And we've seen with um, The Athletic, which is a subscription publisher here in the UK and in the States, they they just launched a whole load of football podcasts as well. So local, there's lots of opportunities. Trinity Mirror just investing in a, a, a sort of nationwide experiment to try and work out what might work in local and how they might make money. But the, the, the the, the revenue is really pretty small so far for a lot of the local publishers from podcasts. So um, that's that's really the kicking point. That's the trigger point is when the money's there, when the business models are there, that's when things are changing. And in local, the scale uh, and, the, and the advertisers aren't quite there yet, I think. Yeah. And then in terms of um, discoverability, um, yeah. you know, we've got so much choice now. Um, there's been quite a few questions on um, SEO. Um, for news content um, and uh, how we use those across various platforms as well um, for discoverability. Yeah, discoverability obviously is going to become uh, this problem as um, most content is discovered through the platforms. Uh, and uh, so you've got, you know, that premium on can you get in the Apple slot because 57% of podcasts come through Apple. Um, and I think that's obviously going to change because Spotify and some of these uh, Pandora, all these uh, different ways of, of, of discovering stuff. Getting a good name is obviously critical. And a lot of those names of programs that were created for radio uh, really don't work in a search environment. So, you know, if your morning show is called AM or PM or whatever it is, you know, that's not a great name for a podcast. Uh, similarly, there are so many um, programs now called the daily yeah. that's probably not ideal either um, uh, and so I think that you know discoverability this this goes back to you know how you get that direct connection uh, using your own platforms is a great starting point but beyond that the whole point is to get to new audiences and that's where SEO using these platforms understanding how the discovery works that is going to be critical going forward okay and then um, I've got a question from Jacob um, and from others as well in terms of um, for a novice launching a podcast for the first time, what are the basic technical tools that are needed? Oh, I'm, I'm hopeless <laughs> on that. I've, I've never, I just sit here and, and talk on webcasts and podcasts. I have no idea how it's done. But from, 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 my, from my broadcast days, I mean, um, you know, obviously the, just getting the right kit. And there are lots of places on the web where you can get advice on this stuff. There's lots of training courses now. Uh, so making sure it's really well recorded, that you don't have the air conditioning on, or all of these things is, is critical. Um, and then um, have a great idea. I mean, have a great sort of passionate idea. So it doesn't have to be massive scale. Um, the other great thing about podcasting is you can reach your audience, uh, and it can be a small audience, it can be a niche audience, but it can still be incredibly valuable. So having that consistency, I think, of what you're creating, why you're creating it, listening, feedback, iterating, all of those things.
And um, we touched on the platforms as well in terms of discoverability. Um, what do you think the relationship between publishers and audio platforms um, are going to be given previous relationships in terms of content? Um, with audio content, where do you think that's headed? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a huge question. I genuinely don't know because it, you know, audio is a bit different. Um, but clearly, um, I suppose one of the ways it's different is that there are a lot of platforms. And I think, you know, we, we've had this period where Apple has been dominant, but I think it's going to be much more varied. And that gives me a bit more confidence that there won't be a sort of single player dominating. On the other hand, you could have, um, you know, some consolidation there and then the smaller players will get bought by the bigger players and we'll be back into a situation essentially where you need to work with one publisher and all, all the problems that we've had. But right now, you've got uh, Spotify, Pandora, Deezer, you know, a whole load of smaller platforms. You've got uh, Google, you've got Apple, you know, there, there are quite a lot of platforms available. And then you've got these new platforms offering opportunities. So there's a lot of sort of competition for the best content, which I think is, is, a, is quite a different situation. Um, I think, you know, this is obviously the, the key problem here is for the broadcasters. So the broadcasters, this is their disruption. You know, audio is their disruption in the same way as, you know, digital was print disruption. And, you know, they desperately need to keep that direct connection, which is why they're pumping so much money into their own platforms. And they do not want Google or Spotify to basically take their content, to, to build their business. Um, so when you click a link in Google, the BBC wants the BBC Sounds experience. They want the BBC's recommendation of the next program to listen to, not Google's or Spotify's. So that's really where I think you're going to see a lot of the action between the broadcasters and the platforms, you know, whereas with, with, the, with the previous platform wars, it's been the print publishers and the platforms. Great. And um, I've got another question from Patricia um, in Poland, and she asks, what do you predict will be the most important development in the news podcasting space in 2020? Um, again, I, you know, it's very hard to make predictions in this space because it is moving so fast. But I, I guess, um, well, I mean, the easy prediction is we're going to get a lot more daily news podcasts, which is probably a sign it's time to stop producing daily news podcasts. You know, when it gets so hot, um, it suggests, you know, I, but though but I, I should say that, you know, in some countries there aren't any. So I think there is still a huge opportunity. But if you're planning to launch one in the US or even in the UK, you know, maybe may a little bit late. But um, I think beyond that, some of the newer opportunities are going to be the ones that are um, made available by some of the newer technologies. So mm -hmm. um, definitely um, voice, though, again, I don't know how quickly that's going to develop. So the sort of on-demand audio, I know, you know Reuters is taking part in the new Google sort of atomized audio product. What's it called, Emily? It's called... Uh, um, uh, here is uh, your news update from Google. It's just launched in the US. Just launched in the US. Um, so hopefully moving into um, the UK regions in Europe. Yeah. So, so I think you know you've got these opportunities in short form audio, in medium form, and long form. But, but actually, I think I think my own personal view is I think a lot of the opportunities will be in the long form area in the short term because because people are kind of wanting that immersive, meaningful experience um, with their headphones, and they really enjoy that. It's a sort of respite from. Uh, the bombardment and get away from the screens and all those things. So I actually think there'll be more commercial opportunity in the long space as well because it's just easier to, you know, add density as less and all the rest of it than it is in the short space, which I think is hard to monetize. And um, have you seen any listening patterns that would particularly correlate with engagement um, or retention of audiences? Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's very hard to get data on this, but, um, but uh, you know, the publishers talk to me, you know, many of them very openly about um, retention rates and, uh, and how long people were listening for. Um, and it was, you know, somewhere between 60 people for daily news podcasts, people were somewhere, somewhere between 60% of the episode to 90% of the episode, which is pretty much the whole thing. Um, which is pretty good. I mean, it, it suggests that, I mean, that's a lot of time. And this is, I think, one of the reasons it's so interesting because publishers in digital alone, just on websites, find it really hard to get more than, you know, a minute a day out of people. So if you're getting 25 minutes a day out of people, even if it's your most loyal users, you know, that is a really significant thing you can build on. It's very hard to build habit and monetization models on one minute a day. So, so this is why I think people are so interested in, in podcasts. Absolutely. Building a whole new relationship. Mm -hmm. 
the audience. Um, I've got a question from Rita. Um, in terms of your advice for smaller publishers that have small staff, like mm. you touched on how many people a day we have, it's a yep. huge production team. Um, what, what advice would you give them in terms of starting to produce podcasts? Yeah, I mean, there's just loads of examples of uh, podcasts that are done by one person or, or two people that um, also connect. So a great idea delivered consistently. Um, you know, you don't need to do all this sort of clever production. Yes, obviously, there's going to be much higher production. At, you know, if you're trying to do a, a Netflix style, Spotify style original documentary, the production values and the costs of that are going to increase and people's expectations are going to increase. But if you've got something to say or you're doing a local podcast uh, and you're doing it on a weekly basis and it's chat interview based, there, it's a pretty low risk, cheap way of making that connection and building an audience. So I think, you know, start with something where you know there's genuine need and sort of build it up from there. And then as you get more money, you can invest more resources into it. Okay. And then um, in terms of we touched on it's, it's difficult to measure success, but is there any way um, you, we can measure um, podcast success against competitors? Is there any kind of competitive data? Right. So what's interesting is that um, uh, the industry is kind of creating those. So in the US, that's PodTrack. So this is essentially an opt-in process where the publishers say we want to be part of this and that they allow the sort of tagging of content or the issuing of the data to a central agency that collects it and provides those benchmarks. So PodTrack does the list. It doesn't give the actual numbers, but it will tell you the order of the most popular. In, um, in Sweden and in Denmark, they've gone even further. So they have the pod index. And here, the actual numbers are created. So you can actually track uh, in a consistent way. Um, they're not using IAB2 standards yet, but they're moving towards them. They have their own standards. Um, but everyone's moving towards IAB2. And, and so you will be able to compare how, how your, your micro bulletin is doing against a daily news podcast or whatever. And the same is happening in, in Denmark. Now, we don't have that in the UK yet. Um, and I think that would be really helpful for advertisers, obviously, to see which are the most popular. Um, uh, so different countries are moving in different ways, but I think that is emerging and that will happen in the next few years. Great. And uh, I've got a question from Rafael. He's a journalist in Brazil. Um, and he wants to know, is there a magic number of minutes for a news podcast <laughs> um, that, so they're not boring their listeners? Uh, hi, Rafael. Um, so I think it's, uh, again, it, uh, that's why we sort of split it up into the different types. So if you're doing a, if you're doing a micro bulletin aimed at voice, then it seems to be one to two minutes. If you're, if you're doing a sort of news, uh, if you're doing a, um, a sort of an update podcast or a deep dive podcast, then think about what people's average commute time is. So this is really why, you know, the daily is 25 minutes a day or whatever it is. Um, because, you know, they they find that that's, about right. So I talked to a number of publishers about this, and and most of them are producing podcasts between 20 and 25 minutes for the for the sort of deep dive, and then um, some of the other roundups are more aimed at the home, where you know you've got maybe 10 or 15 minutes to have your breakfast, get out of the house, and you you might want to put on a couple of these sort of updates. So it partly depends what you're trying to do, um, but that seems to be the sort of broad uh, that seems to be the broad. Uh, view at the moment in the publishing industry, whether that's right or not is another question. Right. And then in terms of promoting podcasts, have you found any marketing strategies, promotions to be particularly effective? Right. Yeah. Um, so we, we've already talked about using your own channels, number one. Um, one of the own channels that is probably underused, which is um, which I think is really interesting, is using uh, your own feed. So the daily, for example, has started to promote uh, some of its other New York Times podcasts within its own podcast, but also within the feed. So I think there was one documentary they were doing, it's in the report, um, which they managed to get a significant audience for because you've already got millions of people a day accessing the feed. So you can kind of give them a sample of a new podcast or you can play that podcast uh, as a sort of house ad within your existing successful podcast. And then the other mechanism is using other um, other networks, so having relationships or partnerships with other successful podcast providers. That's why Vox has 200 podcasts, because it has a lot of successful podcasts, which means it can then um, use that to advertise its own podcasts and to launch 
new podcasts and get the discovery for, for, for new audiences very quickly. Brilliant. And then finally, what challenges or obstacles did you find during the research? Um, do you think there are some other blind spots that you'd like to explore in future research on this topic? Yeah, I found this really hard. <laughs> I found it very hard because, because it's such a big subject and it's so hard to categorize anything in the sort of digital space where nothing quite fits perfect categories. Um, so I think, you know, finding the story when all these countries are at different places as well, you know, the statistics look similar in many places, but actually, you know, the US podcasting scene is so different from, from how it is in Sweden. Um, so I, you know, I'd love to revisit it in 18 months and sort of look at some of these questions again. And I think, you know, with hindsight, you'd always do a few things differently, but I, I think what, you know, the key thing is it's just going to continue to be a fascinating area to watch over the next 12 months. It's going to change very quickly. And uh, so I think sort of open research like this, which is what we try and do, uh, hopefully is at least a starting point for people to have a conversation. Absolutely. And unfortunately, um, that is the last question and all we have time for today. Um, so thank you so much again, Nick. Thank and you. Um, thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, for all of you listening, um, we'll follow up with an email within 24 hours with a recording um, and the full Reuters Institute report. And if anyone has any questions about audio from Reuters or has any feedback that would help in the development of our new products in the audio and voice space, um, there'll be contact details on the email. Please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And on behalf of Reuters, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye.